life doesn't come with an owner's manual. Sure, members of cults, and there are a lot of cults. Whatever you might call yours is your business. But these devout followers might object to the thought that there's no real handbook or set of instructions, not even a pamphlet, for exactly what we're supposed to do with this. Rules exist, maybe, but no official blueprint. So, we make it up, and then impose it upon those around us. For example, here's what we've come up with in America as the formula to a happy life. One, go to college and, of course, graduate because, two, that's how you get a great job. Three, gotta get nice stuff like a car. Basically, add to the debt that college probably cost. Four, oh, of course, before it's too late, get married. Five, get a mortgage on a home. More debt. Six, have kids because, <laughs> yeah, you obviously know how to rear another life, right? And seven, work for 40 years, save, then retire. Now, picking these steps apart might prove counterproductive for the time we have together here today, so I'll spare you the details of why, among other things, the order of these steps never sits well with artists or any of the improvising type. Because see, figuratively speaking, some of us are classical music types, and others of us are jazz music types. Which is to say, some just prefer to follow the lines of sheet music, never taking their eyes off the conductor's baton with no questions, no problems, no pushback. While the other type, the jazz type, we, because yes, I am one of the jazz types, we prefer opportunities to improvise. Certainly, we may respect the notes on the sheet, but we must have time and room to do our own thing. Ad-libbing isn't just a choice. It's part of our DNA. Miriam Saeed was always very much the classical type. Even as a young girl, whenever she grabbed the Crayola box and went to work, Miriam never dared color outside the lines. Until she did. The first 20 years of her life were very much by the book. Well, since we've established earlier that there is no official book, perhaps I should say her first 20 years were what was to be expected. But it was right around step one of the adult happiness blueprint, that one we outlined earlier that starts with the whole college thing, is when, for Miriam Saeed, stuff started to go from classical to very jazzy. Now, you've likely concluded by now, just by hearing her Arabic surname, that Miriam is Muslim. Calling Atlanta home now, her family didn't move there until she was a teenager, leaving the small South American country of Guyana for better job opportunities and the respectable Muslim population of the burgeoning U.S. city. Now, like most parents, regardless of religion, Miriam's mother and father only saw two things when it came to their daughter. One, what they wanted to see, and two, what she showed them, the latter of which wasn't very much. So as far as they knew, she was a good girl who prayed five times a day like she was supposed to. She was a smart girl who never brought trouble to herself with the drama of boys. And they told everyone who'd hear them that she was going to make a wonderful doctor someday and an even better wife. So again, by 20 years old, her track to happiness and eventual retirement, of course, appeared pretty much set. 
And then, no more than a month after she turned 21, going into her third year at the George Washington University in D.C., she met an enigmatic poet by the name of Taj Kamal who would play an integral role in her classical to jazz metamorphosis. Taj Kamal, who also answered to the name TK, was a Baltimore kid studying public policy at the University of Maryland by day and a quiet revolutionary by night. Miriam immediately picked up on TK's brilliance, which was evident through the subjects, wordplay, metaphors, and allegories delivered on that stage. But after a dynamic performance that brought the entire coffee shop to its feet, Miriam's conversation with the artist afterward revealed a soft-spoken, introverted genius who saw the world in ways that made Miriam constantly hungry for more. They made a deep connection that night, one that Miriam would later admit left her feeling as if her whole world had shifted. It was in that moment that Miriam knew that for the first time in her life, she was in love. But what she also knew was that because of this love, life, for her, would never ever again exist inside the lines. Because for 20 years, Miriam's parents didn't see, and she had purposely neglected to show them, the things that made her, her. Like, she actually didn't want to be a doctor, and never really did and she was pausing school until she figured things out. Oh, and when her parents saw her during this conversation, her hair wasn't covered. So she went ahead and also revealed to them that she preferred not to wear hijab anymore, and in fact, had been secretly removing it since high school. And while she was at it, she figured she should tell them that she was grappling with more than just career choices and clothes. And then she told them, finally, that marriage, for her, whenever it eventually did happen, would be different from what they thought it would be because she was in love with the poet she met that night at an open mic in Maryland, named Taj Kamal, but who also went by just TK. But oh, yeah, I should tell you that both of these were stage names, so to speak. TK's full, real name, Miriam revealed to them, was Kamala Tajiri Rahman. Now, TK was never burdened with the task of having to come out because she was never in. When she was eight years old, she came home from school and told her mother, quite matter-of-factly, that she liked another little girl in her class. Her mother, of course, wanted to know exactly what she meant by liked to which little TK responded by saying that this girl was different. She was pretty and she liked being around her more than the other girls who she considered just friends. She called this girl her crush. And her mother, in fact, both of her parents, who were clear now, very clear, accepted this very precise statement of clarification. But to be transparent with you, TK's parents were both artists who traveled the world working and befriending all kinds of people so they truly understood and lived by the now heavily hashtag statement, love is love. So TK's family dynamic was never one that required an explanation of who she was or a reason why. But she was obviously one of the very fortunate few. For Miriam, this revelation to her folks, obviously, went way outside the lines of the image she had been coloring for everybody for the first 20 years of her life. Sure, she could have tried to tell her parents that this was about being happy, but this really wasn't about happiness. Of course, happiness could come or go. This, her admission, was about truth. And who she was attracted to, who she loved and allowed to love her back, only changed the person she was because in the professing of it, she was now an honest woman. That was nearly 10 years ago. Today, Miriam is as happy as she's ever been. Better yet, content. 
No, she's not a doctor. She's actually on track to be an architect. That's her dream job. Her relationship with her parents has evolved. They, to her surprise, didn't disown her. Rather, since given a chance, they do as best they can to try and just show her that they love her, an effort they continue to practice to this day. Especially since Miriam, their youngest of four, is now a mother. And she's also a wife. Although she struggles to reconcile the world's opinions about her relationships, both the one with God and the one with Taj Kamal, her attract to happiness, she's resigned to the fact that people seldom understand or accept a life that exists outside their lines. So see, the American happiness blueprint laid out earlier isn't universal, but honesty is. Because if Miriam was never true to herself and had never acknowledged true love and had stayed the course laid out for her, sure, she'd be on a much better track to material wealth and eventual retirement. But it's very likely that whenever she heard rhyming or metaphorical words strung together, it would haunt her and just remind her of Taj Kamal, that poet she met when she was 21, the one that could have changed her life from classical to jazz. But see, because of truth, she doesn't have to worry about that. I'm Kayana Ebony Brown, and this is a story of music and men. There are some pretty great musicians out there who couldn't do anything do without anything, you. Without you. When Solomon said that, he was referring to the two diametrically opposing artists that I have on my young record label. Take Taj Kamal, for instance. She's the reason I even started this business of mine in the first place. She had music and no idea what to do with it. I was unemployed with, I guess, time to figure it out. So stepping into this warehouse-looking spot somewhere east of the river that afternoon after parting ways with Solomon, which acted as a rehearsal space because of its really unassumingly great acoustics, my eyes were instantly stapled to TK, seemingly skating around that stage in figurative concert with her band, playing to no audience, as these memories of our less than humble beginnings danced through my head. I stood there analyzing this entire skeleton performance, how she moved, how they played off her direction with improv, how her take on hip hop perspired with the heart and grit of the 90s, but breathed with the energetic social existentialism of today. It had been four years now since she and I had become a tandem. A couple albums and a couple mixtapes later, and here we are, finishing up LP number three and trying at least to figure out how exactly we were gonna make some money with this one. All right, that's it, take five she said to the four others behind her, all wearing or holding different instruments. She hopped off the stage and started toward me, looking taller than her usual five feet and four inches. At 28, she still hadn't lost hope in the idea of getting taller. So, she sometimes attempted to make herself appear more grandiose, wearing shoes that set atop extra thick platforms or heels. Today, however, must have been one of those days when the effort was overlooked or perhaps just underappreciated. Barefoot now, I figured it was safe to assume she decided that today was the day to just work with what she had. If she had any insecurities at all, the desire to be an inch or two taller might have been one of them, although she would never outright admit this. Her mother was an incarnation of Nefertiti, a Baltimore-bred Egyptian who at one time modeled for a living. And her father? <laughs> he was Don Cheadle's doppelganger. 
Man, with those genes, TK could quite literally have been 50 and you wouldn't know it. And with her flawless, butterscotch complexion and girlishly innocent eyes, which sat under a field of ombre locks that finished in aubergine these days, the unexpected sighting of makeup that afternoon didn't add a single year to her appearance. It did, though, ever so slightly enhance her natural beauty, a quality, unlike her height, she actually preferred to play down rather than up. Despite the often changing color of her hair, you would notice its natural style before you did any eccentricities. Without her ever saying a word to you, you'd certainly guess correctly just by looking at her that as an African-American, TK was much prouder about the former part of her race rather than the latter. Western culture and style just was not appealing to her. But over the years, we'd worked together to shape her message lyrically to be quite palatable to the colonizers while maintaining its true intention for those who really needed it. So yeah, Lauren and Latifah would be very proud. We just needed to get to a point where they would actually care. Hey, she said without a smile, as she stepped closer to me, stopping short of any physical greeting. No hug, no handshake, not even a fist bump. When we first met, while working at a now defunct social media startup geared toward music fans about eight years ago, I thought that maybe this kind of sudden, dry, non-greeting was because she was Muslim. I didn't know. I, I knew the innocent contact under American circumstances between opposite sexes was prohibited. So I figured maybe it was across the board. It's not. Had we met more recently, I might have considered it a personal preference not to be too friendly, since she did have a partner. In fact, her three-year-old marriage had already produced a two-year-old kid. But the stoicism in our meetings had nothing to do with that either. I realized early on that TK just had her quirks, and things she deemed unnecessary, like small talk, appetizers, and touching for no reason, were among the top three. Needless to say, our initial encounters always felt very abrupt. So what's up? She asked. To which I replied, mm, cardio. Oh yeah, and not getting to the point quickly enough was another one of her pet peeves. So midway through the fourth bar, you take this unusually uncomfortable breath, almost like a gasp for air. And it's because the sequence of metaphors before don't allow you to breathe naturally in order to give the delivery you're going for. So yes, cosmetically, you're in decent shape, although you could stand to gain a pound or two, maybe. But cardiovascularly, or maybe it's cardiovascular-wise, you're unable to effectively give the performance you desire. So cardio, run, swim, bike, half an hour, four to five times. I'm surprised you're here and not getting cardio yourself, running around, jumping through hoops for Bieber. I got what she was implying, but offered the rebuttal. Hey, Lucas is far more James Bay than he is Justin Bieber. And you're so proud of yourself because you know the difference, aren't you? I was ready to move on, so I let her have that last one. You ever listen to that show on blast? Comes on at 8 o'clock on the radio, which you know I don't listen to. Too much Bieber for my taste. Well, guess who they're interviewing this Friday? And it ain't Biebs, baby. She gave me a double take. The first glance was dismissive because obviously I couldn't have been referring to her being the one on DC's top radio station for hip hop music. The second look, however, was a realization that yes, I was seriously saying that she was the one who was going to be on DC's number one station for hip hop. So I posed the question before she could ask it. How did I pull off getting you on the highest rated hip hop show in the city? I didn't say this to her in the moment, but between me and you, the answer? Well, I just asked nicely. But here's how it actually happened. So the radio station was located atop an eight-story tall building that required a scanning key or combination code in order to get in before even reaching a secured entrance with a guard 
and another locked door, which I wouldn't doubt requested a secret word before opening. Yeah, Fort Knox, sands the gold. All of that is a moot point, however, when the broadcasters operate outside of the building, which they do sometimes in an effort to connect with their listeners in person. But this was a commercial radio station. So even though On Blast featured a segment spotlighting up-and-coming artists by interviewing them and playing some of their music, there was a catch. The so-called spotlight was usually focused on new or unheard of major label artists that needed the promotion. Or who could afford to pay for said promotion? Anyway, there's a system set up within the music industry to keep the little guys, well, little. And big radio stations, they do play a part. So someone like me with my little record label, despite anything I'd consider success, wouldn't exactly fit the criteria for this show. Amelia Cruz had been on the radio in D.C. for just 11 months now. She was originally from New York, but took a promotion that brought her here. Hosting On Blast was her first opportunity to lead a show of her own. And so far, the ratings said that she was doing a great job. Amelia was Puerto Rican, had two dogs, loved motorcycles, and although she had relapsed twice before, I was certain that she was still an aspiring vegan. This is the kind of stuff you had to really want to know in order to know it. Scrolling through social media accounts just wouldn't cut it. Finding it required digging much deeper. But why did I know all this, you ask? Well, despite all I know about the radio business and how it works, on multiple occasions, I had thoughts about if and how I might get TK's music played on that station. I can admit, I can admit, it was a very trivial thing in the grand scheme of things. But every artist wants to feel the joy that comes with hearing themselves on a major radio station, especially one in their hometown. And I wanted that for TK. Man, who am I kidding? <laughs> I wanted it for me, too. <laughs> So, as serendipity might have it, I was wandering the streets one evening after a meeting trying to decide what was for dinner when I spotted the station truck, table, and banner setting up for a live broadcast. This also happened to be not far from one of the best bakeries in town, which also happened to be a vegan bakery. A vegan bakery that I, as an aspiring, slowly transitioning vegan myself with a monster sweet tooth, happened to frequent on at least a weekly basis. Which means I knew the people there kinda well. It was exactly 5.58 p.m. The bakery closed at six. The girl's hand was just about to turn the lock on that door when I appeared out of thin air. Actually, I was running and pushed through before she could twist that key. Yeah, I saw that look on her face, the one that comes when you find out there's more work to do as soon as it's time to go home. You think I cared though? I'd made it. But it was still a roll of the dice because people are either salty snackers or sweet snackers. And of all the research I had compiled, this one small bit of information, whether Amelia was a salty or a sweet, was not something I had learned about her. So I had my fingers crossed, hoping that at least one of her teeth was sweet. I was standing at the radio station pop-up table with a half dozen various flavors of moderately freshly made vegan cupcakes. And as she stood in front of me, nearly salivating, looking down into the box, Amelia, I found, was in fact, yes, a sweets lover. Six flavors, all 100% vegan, I said. She grimaced, surprised that I knew this. I just smiled. And you know, the best place to get these is... I closed the box, revealing the name of the bakery she was just about to say. You know what? They're all yours. I just have one small favor to ask. She looked at me, waiting. My artist, Taj Kamal. I'd like for you to feature her as the spotlight artist on your show. <laughs> That's it? She said as if my request was minuscule while already taking the box from my hand. <laughs> Done. 
Just give your information to my intern. She was eating a cupcake before I could even thank her. Now, TK stood there waiting for me to give her the answer for how I had gotten her on this radio station. But I figured, artists don't need to know how the sausage is made. So I didn't bother going into all that with her. To answer the question, I simply told her, <laughs> you know, I have my ways. Uh, but commercial radio, though? It wasn't so much a question as it was an expression of obvious uncertainty toward the idea. We were independent. The plan was to keep it that way. To keep everything independent of big corporation persuasion. Pursuing commercial radio was obviously not a part of the plan. But sometimes, I figured, if you see a way in, you go for it. I know, I know, not part of the plan, I admitted to her. It was, it was a shot in the dark, and I, man, I just took it. She sucked in all of the air around us, trying to reconcile this idea. But this was how our relationship went. She trusted me. She believed in me just like I believed in her. The bottom line was, she just wanted to make music, not business decisions, which is why we worked so well together. She never gave me any pushback. So I felt free to take chances like this one, even when it fell outside of our original plan. Well, will you at least be there with me? And before I could answer, my phone began singing, muffled as it was buried deep down in the messenger bag that was draped across my chest. As I began my frantic search for the phone with TK watching and waiting, it hit me again. I didn't realize until after I began working with Lucas, my other artist, just how much TK preferred me to be monogamous with my time and attention. With Lucas now, my polyamory kind of bothered her. Yes, yes, I will be there, I responded. But look, I got to take this. It's someone with some information I need about something somewhere I need to be. I said with the phone now in my hand. <laughs> and over her shoulder, she shouted. Yeah, you better answer that before you end up saying too much or not enough. You know what? Cardio. Is that enough? I said back to her as I took the phone call, which turned out to be one I had been waiting for all day. This episode of Of Music and Men was written and produced by me, Kayana. Now, the music for this episode was provided by Filmstro, arranged and designed for this episode by yours truly. Now, we also had Sevens Club by Jeff Lopez. And the music for your word of inspiration is Stars by Khalil Ismael. For more information on these artists and how you can support their efforts, visit the show notes in your podcast app or just go to ofmusicandmen.com slash podcast and select this episode. If you would like to have your music featured on the show, check out our website for more information on how to submit. Now, of course, you know, of Music and Men is much more than just a podcast. Jeez. The novella series is available online and in online bookstores. And if you wish to have a physical copy, you can get it on our website at ofmusicandmen.com where you can also get t-shirts and other cool merch. Don't forget to subscribe at Apple, Stitcher, or whatever it is you prefer to listen to podcasts. And remember to rate and review. Maybe I should, yeah, subscribe, then rate, then review. Oh, yeah, I'd love to hear what you think. Lastly, connect with us on Patreon, where you can become a part of this project and its journey and help it to grow to everything it was meant to be. Make sure to share this some way, somehow, with at least one of your friends. And follow Of Music and Men everywhere online at Of Music and Men. And when you do, please don't hesitate to reach out. Artists and entrepreneurs are a very unique type. I mean, we face lots of rejection. It's almost too often for comfort. 
So whether you're a seasoned business owner or creator, aspiring to be one, or you're simply just here to hear a great story, I want to always give you something to ponder. Until next time. Today's word is probably by every successful person that ever lived. If the plan doesn't work, change the plan, not the goal. Now, these are definitely words that I live by. I can't tell you how many times or how many ways that I've changed this plan, but I've never once, not once, changed the goal. Think about how you can alter the plan that you have, maybe a plan B, C, or D, but how you can stay consistently on track for the goal you desire. Next time on Of Music and Men. So here's how this convoluted mess of a scenario I got myself into was set to go. The guy Dante, the one I'd met up with on Wisconsin Avenue while with my friend Solomon, apparently knew the guy doing renovation work on the club's general manager's house. The handyman would text Mr. Chan when she left for work. Mr. Chan, who was also a patron of this handyman's services, ran a small tax business across the street from the club. Mr. Chan would then text a building manager who not only had the keys to the club, but was also scheduled for a visit that day. That building manager would be the one to let me in. Now that call I'd received while I was with TK was from Dante, guy from Wisconsin Avenue, telling me to be at the club in 20 minutes. The GM, he said, usually only had a 10 to 15 minute downtime window at the club on show days, which was most days. So I had to be precise in arrival and with my pitch. Hey, look, I know it sounds ridiculous, but with all of my lack of luck with getting my guy on that stage, I was willing to give just about anything the old college try at this point. That's next time on Of Music and Men.